Séminaire sur le droit global. Nous avons reçu jusqu'ici déjà le professeur Benoît Friedman déjà au mois de février. Il nous avait présenté une introduction pragmatique au droit global. Nous avons reçu la semaine dernière le professeur Raphaël Domingo qui lui nous a présenté sa théorie plutôt juste naturaliste du droit global, même s'il n'aime pas ce terme. Il nous l'a rappelé encore lorsqu'il était présent. Alors c'est un séminaire qui est euh, le séminaire de tous les défis, c'est un séminaire assez difficile sur le plan thématique, parce que la matière, le droit global, en tant que telle, est une matière qui est nouvelle, qui est controversée, qui est complexe, parce que aussi la doctrine juridique française, il faut l'admettre, est très balisée, hein, on ne va pas dire fermée, mais elle est très balisée en tant que telle, et ici on sort complètement avec le droit global, on sort complètement des balises traditionnelles, c'est difficile également parce que on travaille tant en français qu'en anglais, donc il va falloir pouvoir jongler aussi entre les différentes langues, notamment en plan conceptuel. Il faut traduire aussi les concepts euh, utilement, pour le flow, par exemple. Euh, difficile également parce qu'on convoque dans ces séminaires-ci du droit international, du droit administratif, de la philosophie du droit, de la théorie du droit, de la philosophie politique et euh, bien entendu des théories de la justice, et c'est difficile enfin parce qu'on construit ensemble, ou on essaie de construire ensemble, un objet de recherche, c'est bien évidemment tout le défi de la recherche scientifique en droit euh, et, et de la recherche en général. Ici, c'est l'objectif de ce séminaire, tout peut être discuté, il n'y a pas d'autorité en tant que telle, on peut tout casser dans un sens Nietzscheen si on le souhaite, euh, on peut tout remettre en cause systématiquement, à condition évidemment de contribuer à un moment donné à la construction de quelque chose, et ce quelque chose, c'est la pensée du droit à l'échelle du monde, ce qui n'est pas rien en soi. Alors, nous aurons encore deux autres séances ce mois-ci. Le professeur Anne Peters viendra le 26 mai, le jeudi 26 mai, nous parler du constitutionnalisme global, et le professeur Jean-Bernard Roby de Sciences Po Paris viendra nous parler le 31 mai, du rapport entre ordre juridique dans la globalisation. Et le séminaire reprendra ensuite son cours au mois d'octobre, hein, ce qui nous permettra de, de digérer aussi les premiers euh, séminaires de, de cette année, euh, année académique-ci. Et je remercie encore et toujours euh, Pierre Couturier pour euh, sa, son implication dans l'organisation de ce séminaire, ainsi que Pierre Michel, qui n'est jamais loin non plus lorsqu'il s'agit de s'impliquer dans ce type d'événement et l'organisation de ce type d'événement. Merci à tous les deux énormément pour votre soutien tout à fait précieux. Alors pour l'heure et dans les médias, nous avons l'immense plaisir de recevoir aujourd'hui le professeur Sabino Cassese, ancien juge de la Cour constitutionnelle italienne, éminent spécialiste du droit administratif, du droit constitutionnel, mais surtout, et avant tout en ce qui me concerne, penseur et architecte du droit global. Il a contribué euh, également avec, euh, parmi l'ensemble de ses travaux, il a contribué aussi avec euh, l'Université de New York à construire, à l'émergence de la théorie du droit administratif euh, global. Et ses écrits vont porter sur la démocratie globale, l'émergence d'une démocratie globale, le due process, au point de vue euh, global toujours, la global rule of law, tous ces écrits-là sont des références incontournables de notre matière et pour quiconque s'intéresse au droit global, eh bien, il faut inévitablement euh, euh, eh bien, se pencher sur les travaux du euh, professeur Cassese. Alors je fais circuler parmi vous euh, deux de ces ouvrages, euh, euh, dont euh, le dernier qui porte sur le droit administratif global et qui est un manuel tout à fait passionnant sur cette théorie particulière, cette approche particulière du droit global, et un autre ouvrage, au-delà de l'État, qui présente le droit au-delà de l'État, hein, qui, qui change véritablement le paradigme, et qui est euh, la traduction d'une série d'articles, de six ou sept articles, euh, qui avaient été produits dans un premier temps, euh, je pense en langue italienne et certains d'entre eux en langue anglaise, et qui vous présente la pensée du professeur Cassese sur, sur le droit global. Alors, le professeur Sabino Cassese est en réalité ici, chez lui, euh, puisqu'il a reçu le titre de docteur honoris causa de notre université, et ce en 1987, si je ne m'abuse. 87. 87. Hein 
dans, dans ces eaux-là. Euh, euh, et donc c'est avec évidemment beaucoup d'émotions beaucoup de, aussi qu'on le reçoit euh, ici à, à la faculté. Il propose aujourd'hui de euh, vous de faire une conférence sur les dimensions globales de la rule of law. Je vous rappelle évidemment que le thème du séminaire, c'est de s'intéresser aux valeurs et à la protection des valeurs, droit de l'homme, démocratie, état de droit dans euh, les théories du droit global. Et donc évidemment, ici, on est au cœur de cette thématique-là. Euh, thématique Monsieur le professeur, on va, euh, je vais vous céder euh, la parole pour euh, une heure environ euh, d'exposé. Euh, après quoi, nous ouvrirons les discussions. Je sais que les discussions ici sont en général euh, tout à fait dynamiques. Hein, donc je, je vous le... Je vous l'annonce déjà. Euh, et euh, donc, juste avant cela, je voudrais simplement, en guise d'accueil, conformément à la traduction, que nous applaudissions notre invité avant de céder la parole. You know that I am going to speak English. Uh, for reasons that I have uh, given in other situations. But the topic of my talk is. Uh, is there a global rule of law? I will start with one example, and I move, will move on to three topics. The example is the example of the famous Mumbai Urban Transport Project. This was a project financed by the World Bank in India, the largest ever project funded by the World Bank. And this project required the resettlement of 100,000 people. You know what is a resettlement? The houses or shops are destroyed and the people are moved from one place to another place. So it's very important for the life of the people in Mumbai. Now, some shopkeepers' associations and owners' associations complained with the World Bank Inspection Panel, notice, World Bank Inspection Panel, which is a quasi-judicial body, that they had not been informed and had had no opportunity to express their views before taking the decision of resettlement. At the end of an open investigation conducted with a quasi-judicial procedure, the inspection panel, acting as a court, concluded that the Mumbai Transport Authority and the state of Maharashtra the state where Mumbai is located in India, had, according to the World Bank policies, an obligation to inform and to hear. To inform and to hear, which is notice and comment. And I will come back to notice and comment procedures. So through a global quasi-judicial body, the notice and comment procedure was introduced into Indian law. Through a, a global body implementing global rules, World Bank policies in a national uh, context, India. Now, cases like this one are numerous in the global space, as many international treaties are not just contracts, but agreements through which national governments set up global institutions with law-making bodies and dispute settlement procedures. Therefore, these global institutions can run of themselves, follow the rule of law, and impose the rule of law on national legal orders. As a consequence, the usual approach by which the states, the governments, the national governments, are the masters of the treaties 
you may remember this expression has been uh, used by the German Bundesverfassungsgericht, the federal tribunal, constitutional tribunal in Germany. And the only active force, while the global institutions depend on them, is not any more valid. Now, I will approach this topic in three points. First, I will say a few words on the global space. What is the global space? Is there a legal order in the global space? This is number one. Then number two is, are there procedural obligations in the global space? And question number three is, are there global courts in the global space? So I will address in the first point the environment, the context, and the second point the main institutions that are under the heading uh, rule of law, due process of law, and in the third point the, the second question which is, is under this chapter rule of law which is judicial review. If you have a court and if you can ask to a court judicial review of a decision taken, the taken. So procedural obligation is before the decision is reached and global courts come after the decision is reached in order to get this decision reviewed by a court. Now, I, you, you will notice that I, in my talk I will devote more time to the third topic, which is courts, judicial globalization, judicial review at the global level. I will now start with my first point, which is the global space. Now, to understand the role, the role of law in the global space, I think that we must first rid ourselves of the idea that the global space is only a negotiated order, not subject to law. Now, this is the basic principle of international law. International law is made of treaties, and treaties are contracts. So, there is no legal order, they are just contracts. Now, I therefore do not follow two points which have been made, which are very skeptical about globalization, which have been made, the first one by Roberts and the second one by Posner. Posner, I mean Eric Posner, the son of Richard Posner, the most famous judge and professor. The son is also a professor. I think he's now teaching in Chicago or Harvard. And, and he wrote a book on uh, the perils of global legalism. So it is at the center of my uh, evaluation. Now, I read a few lines from Roberts. This is an article in the Modern Law Review published in 2005. I read, we are in a supra-state, a cephalous world where leaving self-help and ultimately warfare on one side, the institutional shapes found will be the product of and depend for their effectiveness upon negotiated understanding. So, negotiation, no rule of law. This is the point made by Roberts. And then he adds, we should be very cautious in representing what are essentially negotiated orders, again, negotiation, so contracts, treaties, at regional and global levels, as legal orders while they remain significantly different from those at the level of the state. 
as radically different modes of ordering and decisions are represented together as legal, law loses analytic purchase. So his point is that you cannot uh, accept the idea that there is a, a global legal order. There are only contracts among actors which are mainly states, national governments. Another skeptical view has been uh, presented by Eric Posner. According to Posner, the flaws of global legalism stems from the fact that the global space, sorry, in the global space, there is legislation without legislators, enforcement without enforcers, adjudication without courts. Now, in my opinion, the global space is not in such a primitive stage of development. On the contrary, we can find in the global space six features, binding rules addressed not to national governments but to private parties. Second, an institutional setting with specialized, specialized bodies and well-established links among them. Third, a set and many subsets of legal and physical persons subject to the rules and to the orders stemming from global organization. Five, a wide range of rights and obligations, and finally, many procedurals, procedural obligations and courts called to resolve disputes. So the global space is not only made by treaties, but also by rules, by legal actors, by procedures, by procedural obligations and by judicial review uh, by courts, which are not national courts but international courts. And this was my first point. My second point is about procedural obligation. If you ask somebody in the US or in the UK or in Germany, what is the rule of law, what goes under the title rule of law, he will say, first, right to a hearing, participation, dialogue with the decision-making uh, body, and second, judicial review, possibility for private actors to ask a court to review the decision taken by the, uh, by the decision-making body. So I will now address these two points, procedural obligations one and second, uh, global courts and judicial review. Uh, I will start quoting a famous WTO, World Trade Organization, appellate body decision, famous case which is called the shrimp case. You know what is a shrimp. Yeah. We usually eat shrimps. Now, in the famous shrimp case, the WTO appellate body reaffirmed the relevance of the rule of law in the global context. With these words, I quote, Article 10.3 of the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, GATT, 1994, establishes certain minimum standards of transparency and procedural fairness. Notice, transparency and procedural fairness in the administration of trade regulation which are not met here in the case of shrimp. The non-transparent and ex parte nature of the internal governmental procedures 
as well as the fact that countries whose applications are denied do not receive formal legal procedure for review. So the lack of judicial review or appeal from a denial of application are all contrary to the spirit, notice, to the spirit, if not the letter of Article 10, Paragraph 3 of the GATNT 1994. So this decision was a clear decision in favor of having transparent decision-making process, participation during, particip during decision-making, and judicial review of a decision. So opportunity for people to go to a court and ask to quash a decision which is illegal, which is contrary to the law. In this case, the rule of law, transparency, the right to a hearing, and judicial review was recognized by a global court, WTO, dispute settlement body, the appellate body, but applied to internal governmental procedures. Now, the question is, what about global procedures themselves. In other words, if the global courts establish that there is an obli a procedure obligation by national bodies, it is also true that they will establish a procedure obligation for global institutions, for global bodies. Are global institutions required to abide by the rule of law and thus to provide transparency, the right to a hearing and judicial review of their own decisions. Their own decisions, I mean the global decisions. As more and more national powers are transferred from domestic agencies to global authorities, can those authorities avoid granting private individuals the same rights that they otherwise enjoy in their national legal orders? This is a very important question. Let me pause for a moment and tell you what, why, when was raised this problem. This problem was raised by American industries. They went to Washington and they said to, to, to the American president, we have the 1946 Administrative Procedure Act, you know, the famous basic procedural obligation of the federal government. This was an act signed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, if the regulation of industry flows from Washington authorities, from federal American authorities, we have a right to be heard. But if you move this power, you, the, the, the American Parliament, the American Congress, this power, you move this power from Washington to Geneva, to the WTO, at that point, my right to be heard evaporates, disappears. I don't have any more this possibility because they take this decision and they also raise the problem of the expenses, travel expenses, is more expensive to travel E. Supposing that they give me this right to be heard, who is going to pay me the price of the ticket, the airplane ticket to go from Washington or from, from California to, to Geneva? So this is a real problem. Uh, now, one of the most astonishing features of the global space is the speed with which it has developed principles in order to subject global administrative proceedings, not only national, but global administrative proceedings, to the rule of law. Principles like the right to a hearing, the right to provide 
a reasoned decision. You know what is a reasoned decision, decision motivated. And have been enforced, have developed, and have been enforced in the global space in the course of just a few years while their development in domestic legal orders took decades or even centuries, depending on the state in question. And I may remember to a, a French audience that uh, while the, the, Amer the US Administrative Procedure Act was enacted in 1948, the first was the Austrian in the 20s of the last century, uh, the Spanish in the 70s, uh, the Italian in the 90s, and the French quite recently. It was one or two years ago that you had uh, a basic law on administrative procedure and rights of the people during the decision-making process of the administration. So the development of these procedural principles in the global space has a double impact. They apply to global decision-making processes and they affect also domestic proceedings. So at this point we have an Italian national procedural law which regulates administrative <laughs> procedure but we must also follow the standard, the procedural standard established by global institutions in many areas, uh, environment uh, protection or trade uh, uh, or labor, etc. Global rules grant participation rights to private parties vis-a-vis -vis domestic authorities, and this is global versus national. Second, to national governments vis-a-vis -vis global agencies or national governments or other national governments. Third, to global institutions vis-a-vis -vis other global institutions. Four, to private parties appearing before global institutions. So you see, when you move from the national setting into the global setting, and you assume that participation rights, you have participation rights in both areas. In, na in the national arena, you only have uh, a private party and the administration, the préfet, or a ministry. But in the global area, you have a more complex participation right because you have uh, a participation right of people vis-a-vis -vis their national governments, of people vis-a-vis -vis global institutions, of global institutions vis-a-vis other global institutions, to, to national governments vis-a-vis -vis global institutions. So there is a complex web of participatory rights in this area. So participation is ensured both vertically, private parties before national governments and global agencies, and national governments before globalist organization, and horizontally, national governments before other national governments, and global institutions before other global institutions. So participatory rights created at the global level establish links among the different levels of government and between the different governmental bodies involved and civil society. Now, uh, these and other similar provisions raise many interesting questions. Uh, how does putting domestic agencies and private parties on the same level change the administrative procedure in question? This is one question. Another question is, 
Do hearings in the global arena play the same role as administrative hearings do in national law? The third question is, how does the interest representation model, a model which was developed by Dick Stewart, who is a professor at the NYU Law School, who was with me and Benedict Ginsburg, one of the promoters of the study of global law, apply to the global legal order? And another question is, do particular structures and procedures perform the same function in the global environment as they do in the national context? So it is important to understand that you have the same institutions, the same rules, but in a different context. They may change. And so it is important is to understand where they change. From this point of view, the global due process of law, which this is a, a real paradox, uh, compared to, to the domestic counterpart, the local process of law, due process of law, is richer but less effective. It is richer <coughs> because as far as openness, participation and consultation are concerned, and is less effective because transparency, reason, decision making and judicial review are not always provided for with the result that the rule of law is not, if not fully developed in the global arena. Let, let me mention as an example. Consider ICANN. You know what is ICANN? ICANN is the, the, the global regulator of internet. No, internet is, all the rules of internet are established by ICANN. It's an internet corporation for assigned names and numbers. ICANN is a non-profit private corporation incorporated in California and based in Los Angeles. Now, if you go on the ICANN website and you read the ICANN bylaws, remember, ICANN is a is a, a global regulator, but is a private body. If you read the bylaws of ICANN, you will see that there you have the equivalent of the Administrative Procedure Act, or the equivalent of the La Guatula Procedure Administrative in, in France. So you have, in this case, a procedural obligation established by a private institutions institution acting as a global regulator. So the conclusion is that uh, in the global space there is a, a, a well-developed body of procedural rules. Those rules are more developed that at the national level while they are less effective. I move now on to my third point, but this third point is much longer than the previous ones. Uh, and the third point has to do with global courts, because uh, if you speak of rule of law, of course, the main topic is, uh, is there judicial review or not? Is there a court where people can bring a case or not. And I will divide my paper on this point in six chapters. And the first I will introduce the subject. In the second I will uh, report the main criticisms which have been developed in the scholarship for judicial globalization. In the third chapter or paragraph, if you prefer, I will address the problem of structure and function of judicial globalization. In the fourth, I will explain the reasons why global courts are established. In the fifth, I will uh, discuss 
two main problems raised by judicial globalization. And in the last point, I will, uh, I will speak about a major product of judicial globalization, which is judicial interchange, the establishment of a constellation of courts. Because you see, as the global and the national are interrelated, there are interactions. You can ask yourself, uh, is the Italian constitution, I was a member, as you heard, of the Italian Constitutional Court for nine years. And is the Italian Constitutional Court having a dialogue with the Strasbourg Court? Is it having a dialogue with the Luxembourg Court? Is it having a dialogue with the WTO dispute settlement body? So the, the, the problem is also, are global courts establishing links with national judiciaries? Because if it is so, you can understand that we are going to be governed by, by judges, the gouvernement des juges. Now, first point, uh, according to the project of international, on international tribunals and courts, there are 125 supranational and global courts. But I call your attention on the fact that we must add to these courts also many quasi-judicial courts, institutions which are not judicial, but they act as judges. One example was the inspection panel. The, w, the, the World Bank inspection panel. Another example are the many compliance committees. Another example is the Article 1904 NAFTA, North American Free Trade Ag uh, Agreement binational panels. The administrative panels of the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center for uniform domain name dispute resolution, problems linked with the internet government. So, in total, you have 145 courts, and again, approximately 120 quasi courts, bodies which are act as courts. Now. Just to give numbers, remember that the number of uh, national states in the world, the members of the UN, you remember how many are they? 193. So we have many more courts and court-like institutions than national governments. The, la the great majority of these courts were established in the last 20 years, and I will come back to this point. And I will call your attention on this point that supranational courts challenge some of the most basic principles of the community of nations. Uh, you may remember that principle basic principle of the international law is that the disputes between states should be solved through negotiations or conflicts. So, wars or treaties, generals or diplomats, and in this case you don't have neither generals nor diplomats, you have judges, so experts in law. The second basic principle which is challenged is that states hold the monopolistic jurisdiction over disputes between their associates. That's not anymore true because you have supranational bodies which are not controlled by states. 
having jurisdiction on disputes. And third, that decisions taken by states, higher courts are final. And I will come back on this point. We were talking about this a few moments ago. Uh, the French Conseil Constitutionnel, the Italian Constitutional Court, the German Bundesverfassungsgericht, all those courts were, until a few years ago, final. They, by final, I mean they had the last word. They were the supreme courts of the country. Not anymore now, because they have referred some questions to a higher court. And if you are a member of a court and you refer the problem to another court, it does mean that you accept the supremacy of that court, that you accept that this court will decide a play, if, will decide a point which will be binding for you. That in, a, the, in my court, we decided that both the Strasbourg court and the Luxembourg court are higher courts, and therefore, at that point, when they took a decision, we had to abide by this decision to comply with this decision. So at that point, at that point, the supreme national courts are not anymore supreme courts, which is a point which has, uh, is debated by, by our American colleagues. And you may know that uh, uh, Steve Breyer, who is a well-known, was a well-known professor at Harvard and who was appointed by President Clinton in the Supreme Court, he has written a book a few months ago. Uh, the title of this book is a very interesting title. is uh, The Court and the World. And his point is that we must open an eye on the world because his opponent, who, is, who died a few months ago, Nino Scalia, uh, was against taking foreign law into national law, the famous originalist thesis. Now, uh, the judicialization of global space has attracted many criticism. And I will mention two critical points and uh, one uh, uh, opinion in favor of judicial globalization. So I want to quote first from a book written by Harry Kissinger, you may remember who is Harry Kissinger. Uh, in his uh, book on uh, Does America Need a Foreign Policy, which was published in 2001, he wrote in less than a decade, an unprecedented concept has emerged to submit international politics to judicial procedures. You notice, international politics submitted to, inter, to judicial procedures, something which is very so different. It has spread with an extraordinary speed and has not been subjected to systematic debate. The danger is that it is being pushed to extremes which risk substituting, listen, the tyranny of judges for that of governments. And he adds, historically, the dictatorship of the virtues has often led to inquisitions and even witch hands, fascist society. So, this is a very strong argument against the national governments losing their control on international politics. Because his point is, at that point, you defer to global courts, and global courts are not responsible to people. Yeah? 
So it is possible that they become a tyrannical government. Another point was made by Eric Posner, which criticized the, so what he calls the global legalism. He says, he writes, I quote, according to the global legalist, international courts advance international justice. They are impartial and independent, and they do justice in the face of the efforts of states to exercise power for gain. And they are indispensable or necessary form of international cooperation. Now, for the global legalist, he continues, the ideal dispute resolution mechanism for international law violation is the international tribunal. But then he goes on by saying, no, that's not true. In the most exciting international litigation is taking place in American domestic courts. This paradox reflects the basic tensions of global legalism. Law without government exists at international level. Law normally requires courts to interpret and enforce it. Effective courts cannot exist without supporting government institutions. No such institutions exist at international level. So his point is, how can you have global courts without having Montesquieu? Le trois pouvoirs. You don't have a, you have global courts, a judicial power, but you don't have an executive power. And you don't have a parliamentary power. You don't have a legislative power. How can global courts survive? The opposite view is that of uh, Joseph Weiler. Joseph Weiler, you may know, is a professor uh, of uh, public law and international law at uh, NYU. He is still now the president of the European University Institute in Florence. Uh, and he's going shortly back to New York. And he's, he has written important contributions on the development of European law. You may know many books he has written on European law. And he has written uh, through the century, I quote, we see, cons we see a consistent thickening of a triadic stratum, arbitration, courts, and panels. The thickening consisted not only in the emergence of the new area subject to third party dispute settlement. Third party dispute settlement means judicial globalization, but in the removal of op option optionality, in the addition of sanctions, and in the general process of juridification. Dispute settlement, the hallmark of diplomacy, has been replaced increasingly by the legal process, especially in the legislative and regulatory dimensions of international law making. And there is too a third stratum of dispute settlement, which may be called constitutional. You, you see, it does not say only you have something similar to the administrative tribunals, but you have something similar to the constitutional tribunals or courts. And consists in uh, the increasing willingness within certain areas of domestic courts to apply and uphold rights and duties emanating from international obligations. So you here have three points made by uh, three famous authors, Kissinger, Posner, and Weiler, two against and one in favor of the development of third party judicial settlement which is not optional, which is important because, of course, two national governments can agree to have a third party dispute settlement on the basis of agreement, but judicial globalization is more, it's not optional. And, and, and with sanctions, 
which means that the court can issue sanctions on national governments as the WTO uh, dispute settlement body can do. Now, uh, my third point on global courts is uh, about structure and functions. Uh, as I said before, in the 90s, 1990s, so only a quarter of a century ago, judicial globalization developed. Um, but judicial globalization has developed incrementally and in a very fragmentary way. So you cannot say that there is a, a global administrative court. You cannot say that there is a, a global constitutional court. You may only say that there is a, a global court for trade. There is a global court for the law of the sea. A global court for the labor. You have a global court or regional court for Europe a regional court for uh, the uh, Mercosur. So you have a fragmentation of global courts. But on the other side, the global space is becoming increasingly court-centered and is increasingly dominated by a part of American culture, we must say that, I mean, America, American scholarship and American scholars have played a very important role. Uh, and therefore, you have in the global space the development of what, what the American call adversarial legalism. Adversarial legalism is legalism which is based on ad adversarial procedures where the two parties fight each other which is outside the usual approach of Italian, French or German uh, procedural law. Parties that can appear before courts are very different. You may have domestic authorities that may appear before the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. Private parties and the World Bank appear before the World Bank Inspection Panel. Both private parties and domestic authorities may appear before the NAFTA binational panel. Only private parties can appear before the administrative panel of the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, Arbitration and Mediation Center. But the decision has an impact on decisions taken by the relevant national registrars. The contracting state and national of another contracting state can appear before the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, arbitral tribunals. What is important to notice is that in the global space, disputes are not bipolar. You know, national disputes are so always bipolar. Disputes in the global space are, most of the disputes, are multipolar because global space provides for judicial review of national decision, even as national courts review global decisions. Regional courts recognize global law as a higher law. Links among different regulatory regimes are established by their respective courts, as I will say in a moment. And the decisions of global courts can have direct effect, penetrating into the domestic law and lifting the veil of national law. Now, and so I move to my fourth point, 
You may ask yourself, why judicial institutions have been spreading? There are many reasons. The first set of reasons is that global institutions need fire alarm systems and judicial mechanism is an effective system to get the cooperation of the people. Uh, let me pause for a moment because you may not be familiar with the fire alarm system. Fire alarm system. Uh, uh, some 20 years ago, two uh, very clever American political scientists studied parliamentary control over the administration. And they used two metaphors. The first one is fire alarm, and the second one is police patrol. Now, you know what is police patrol. Police patrol is, uh, you have seen so many movies, and you know what it is. It's a car, a police car, which goes slowly in the street, uh, putting lights on people who break the law, no? So you have the police going around and looking for lawbreakers, yeah? What is fire alarm? Fire alarm for an American is a, a small glass with a red button. If anybody sees fire, it can break the, 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 the glass and push the button. Now, the metaphor is the following, that one is a top-down process and the other one is a bottom-up process. The second one means participation of the people into the process. So everybody is cooperating in fighting fire in an American city if you have those red button around in the city. Everybody will cooperate. So there is people's participation. While in the other case, you have a top-down process by which you need so many policemen, so many cars, so much fuel, so much money to pay in order to keep under control. Now, think about the real declaration. You may remember the real declaration on environment which was applied in Europe by the Oros Convention. Now, the real declaration, is, there is one principle in the real declaration which says that the best system to protect the environment is through citizens' participation. Why? Because in this case, you have a fire alarm system. Because we all have an interest in having environmental protection. So if we see something which does not go, if we see something which is not good for the environment, we can bring an action before the Oil Convention Compliance Committee yeah? <clears throat> against the government. And there are many cases, one of them, very famous case, it was again the, against the Kazatom from and the Gazak it's the government of Kazakhstan. So this is one reason why it's important to have courts. Because courts, courts have open door. It's like that door. It's not closed like this door. Courts have a, an open door. Everybody can get to a court. And so the court is a part of a fire alarm system. A second set of reasons derived from the national states. Um, courts and court-like bodies can reduce tensions between national, national governments. If you have a dispute between the US government and the Japan government, both national governments can have an interest in not having to decide through negotiations this decision. So it's better to have another independent group of people. Let them do it, yeah? Because 
you don't get involved in it in trying to solve a dispute. So they can act as shock absorbers. How do you say shock absorbers in French? Là comme ça, par choc. No, shock absorbers. We have in our cars. If you have a car, par choc. Par choc. Par choc. Yeah. Shock absorbers. Yeah. Yeah. So the court is a shock absorber of the dispute among two governments. Uh, the third reason for for you may you may smile for this is emulation. Emulation, pure emulation. Um, in an article by two, um, written by two, two very clever British political scientists, and published in uh, 2012, it was written that uh, four international and economic systems emulated the WTO dispute resolution systems. 11 regional supranational bodies have copied the European Court of Justice, having introduced the compulsory supranational oversight of state action with private parties, uh, which private parties too may access. So, uh, if courts work well, some other governments may join other governments in order to establish more courts in order to uh, emulate the previous uh, courts. I move now to my fifth point, and my, I may uh, leave apart my sixth point, which is more complex, and I may uh, present this last point uh, later on after the discussion. The judicial globalization raises two important questions. First, global courts exercise public authority through judicial lawmaking. I mean, what the an American lawyer would say, judicial lawmaking, no, never an Italian or a French or a German lawyer will say judicial lawmaking, because it's a contradiction. <laughs> but their power can neither be justified on the traditional basis of state consent, nor by functionalist narrative. In a democratic context, in the national context, judicial lawmaking is embedded in a political system in which a democratic legislature, a parliament, has the central place in creating norms. Now, the problem is that, which is the problem raised by Eric Posner, you have courts, but you don't have parliaments. And how can courts interact with the legislation? And therefore, global courts are not indirectly, indirectly legitimated in this manner because there is very little parliamentary participation in the selection of the global judges. And second question, and I will leave open this question too, but I have answers to these questions that I will not present now. Second question, and I will finish with this, is how do global courts interact with domestic judiciaries? This is again a question raised by Eric Posner. Uh, you have uh, trade problems at the national level and you have trade problems at the global level. You have environmental problems at the national level and uh, you have environmental problems at the global level. Now. If you have courts at the national level and you have courts in the global level, how can you establish a balance between the two? How the two can cooperate? And here comes the, the literature which, which was started by uh, 
Anne-Marie Slaughter. Anne-Marie Slaughter, she is a, a sociologist and a political scientist in teaching in Princeton of the so-called judicial dialogue, the dialogue of the judges, which is, is in a way important, but it is in a way impossible. It is important because uh, if you have a, take one example, a case of migrants, case decided recently by, by the Strasbourg court, where Italy had uh, removed people coming from Tunisia, not one by one, but as a group which is against the Convention of Human Rights. And you have, at that point, you have a, a national court, a national court, an, an Italian court, but you have also a Strasbourg court. And the case was brought to the Strasbourg court. So it is important. But on the other side, it is impossible. Why it is impossible? Because if you are a member of the court, you are not entitled to establish a dialogue with the members of another court. It's very simple. I cannot make a call to my friends. I could not in the past make a call to my friends in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Germany or, or, or in Paris and, and ask them, what, what do you think about this? Uh, what should I decide on this point? If I may have an informal meeting with my friends in other courts, but I cannot establish an open, transparent dialogue open to other members of other courts with the members of the court. I have to decide on the evidence that I have before me if I'm a, a member of the court. So you see there are two very important questions which are open. And I finished with this because I have spoken more than 50 minutes. <laughs>